I want to give a disclaimer. Um, the message that I'm going to present today was done about three weeks ago, and I just, I'm just now getting around to doing it. So I uh, had no idea that we would be uh, on the verge of World War, War, World War III when, uh, you know, when I was, when I was kind of putting this together. I've just been, been kind of uh, going through some scenarios of, you know, understanding why, you know, why we believe what we believe. And uh, this is just one of those questions that, uh, that I think is very difficult for a lot of people to, ant to, uh, to handle. Um, there's a, a lot of folks out there that think, well, God is so loving that he, he just doesn't let bad things happen in the, to anybody. That he he would never judge me for my sins. There's a lot of folks out there that that talk like that, and really, they uh, they miss they misunderstand really what the what this type of question is about, and they definitely they're ignorant when it comes to knowing who God is, and what's going what's going on what's going on in in this world. So this morning we're gonna. We're going to try to answer this question of why would God allow bad things like earthquakes, floods, plagues, and wars to happen? So we're going to look at some of that. Uh, before we begin, uh, if you want to turn, we're going to be looking in the book of Leviticus at something. So uh, I know uh, a lot of people, I don't know if it, many of you have read Leviticus. It's a lot more fun to say than it is to read. You ever tried that? If you're ever in a bad mood, you ought to just, just pull out the word Leviticus, say it a couple times, and you, all of a sudden you're going to start feeling better because it's a fun word to say. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't believe me? Everybody try it with me. Say Leviticus. Leviticus. See, you're already smiling. See, it's a fun word to say. So uh, <clears throat> why would God allow bad things like earthquakes, floods, and plagues? And we're going to be looking at chapter 18 in the book of Leviticus. Would y'all pray with me? Dear Lord, we just want to ask that you'd be with us this morning, especially as we, we dig into understanding some theology. I know uh, a lot of people, they don't, they don't like to dig into the depths of the scripture and ask those really tough questions sometimes. Lord, we're going we're gonna to ask a very difficult question, and we're going to answer it. And the answer probably will not make us feel very good about the situation that, that we're in, nor the world is in. But Lord, we know that your word is honest and it can help us understand why things are going on, even though even though we may not understand um, how to actually deal with it. We, we can know that you are in control and that you have a plan and we need to trust in you and to have faith. And I, and I want to continue to pray for all those on the prayer request, uh, for Dawn and and her situation and uh, and all the other people that are, um, that are going through difficult situations right now. We know, Lord, that this is just a um, bad time in a lot of people's lives, a lot of sicknesses. I know many people who are sick. Um, and I just ask, Lord, for your hand of blessing on them. Help us, Lord, as we present your word this morning. May we, may we be able to speak your words and to be honest with the interpretation of these scriptures. And help us, Lord, to apply them to our life. God is Lord, in these things, you say my prayer. <clears throat> so why would God allow bad things? Well, Leviticus 18, verse 25, and kind of the tail end of that verse, if you want to look in your scripture with me, or you can kind of look up on, on here, it says that God does visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Now, I don't know about you, but that right there is a scary verse. Does that verse scare you? That the land, when there's an when iniquity is full, that it's that God has programmed into the creation of the world a, a platform in which the earth turns against the sinful inhabitants. Isn't that interesting? That that God says here that the land will itself vomit out her inhabitants. 
Look at verse 3 there. It says, after the doings of Egypt and after the doings of the land of Canaan, shall ye not do. So God is talking to Israel here, and he's telling them that what you saw being done in Egypt, what was being done in Canaan, he says, don't do these things. Don't walk in their ordinances. Don't walk in their traditions. Don't do the things that they did before you got there because the land has rejected those people because of their sinful lifestyles. And then look down to verse 27 of chapter 18. It's God says here, he comes to the conclusion, for all these abominations have men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. So if you wonder why the God sent all the plagues to Egypt, they had done abominations. Whenever they went to Canaan, they had done abominations before God. And you're like, but the, the, the law of God does not, does not apply to those people, right? Wrong. God's laws, these moral laws that he has given here, he says those of God looks at every civilization and he sees what they're doing. And when they venture into this lifestyle that breeds abominations... God says the land will vomit them out. The land is defiled. And God says, Israel, you don't do these things. If you do these things, you are not exempt. It doesn't matter what your constitution says. It doesn't matter what your coin says, even though your coin, like for ours, says, in God we trust. If we commit abominate, these abominations, we are judged the same way that God judged Will, that God judged Egypt and Canaan and also Israel. And God tells Israel, don't do these things or the land will also spew you out as it spewed out the nations that were before you. That's what we see in Leviticus 18 and verse 28. Everybody tracking with me? I bet you're on the edge of your seat now, right? Man, I wonder if we've done those abominations. What are those abominations? Anybody ever read Leviticus 18 before? Do you know these, some of these things that are in there? Some of you do. So why would God allow bad things like earthquakes, floods, plagues, and wars? These are the things that God allows in this world to vomit out the inhabitants that have defiled the land. The earth itself does not want to be defiled. Does that make sense to you? It may not make sense to you because you look out there and you're like, well, the... The earth doesn't really have life of itself. Well, God gave it something. We may not understand it all, but through the earth comes forth life. That's where the grass of the field gets its life, life from, the trees. And we feed off of the earth. But when we defile the land with certain abominations, and you know what's not on this list? Cutting down trees is not on the list. Building factories is not on the list. All the things that they tell us that are so bad aren't on the list. Those aren't the things that actually destroy and defile the land, but something else is, and it is the lifestyle of the civilization that inhabits the land. Everybody with me still? So bad things are really the consequences of these sins, particular sins, and they are, and, and I don't know how much you know about sin in your own personal life, but sin also in a civilization are choices. They are choices that people make. And God doesn't make, nobody makes you do sin. You choose to do those sins. And here we have a civilizations that as a whole, they promote these types of abominations, okay? So choosing sin is equal to choosing all those bad things. You're like, I wonder why, why does God allow these things? God didn't allow these things, okay? The question is wrong. God didn't allow those things. You chose those things. The civilization chooses those things when they choose to commit abominations with their lifestyles. Does that make sense? God doesn't choose it for you. You request it. That's what we have here. That's what's going on in Leviticus 18. And God warns Israel, 
Don't do these things or the same thing that happened to Egypt, the same thing that happened to Canaan will happen to you. Well, we will know that Israel will commit the same things that happened in Egypt and that happened in Canaan. And the same thing that happened to those guys happened to Israel. United States, Arkansas, Jonesboro. If you go and do the same things that Egypt, Canaan, and Israel did, the land will vomit you out. It will spew you out. The land doesn't want you to commit these types of abominations. There's a lot of sins that you can do. You do these, they're on a different level called abomination. Abomination is something that makes God sick. Abomination is something so bad, it makes the earth sick. And you got to wonder. We're on the, we've already seen a World War I, a World War II, and now we're witnessing the potential of another one. Regardless, even if it doesn't become one, there's a war over there. But we know there's things brewing. The whole world is a powder keg. What is going on? And the answer really is quite simple. There's abominations going on. And the world has chosen the abominable lifestyle rather than the blessings and protection of God. You see, in the beginning, God created the world perfect. There was, there was nothing wrong with it. Y'all remember back in Genesis? The world wasn't, wasn't against mankind. It was with mankind. It was good. God created it, and it was good. It was perfect. But in it, God programmed it to be intolerant of abominations. You know how I know that? Genesis 1.10 tells us, And God called the dry land earth, and God saw that it was good. In Leviticus 18.25, I just want to rehearse it with you. I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. I'm going to get to it in a minute, but the verse following that one in Genesis, it says that when Adam sinned, God cursed the earth. Do y'all remember that? That's the only thing in the book of Genesis. When all the when all of the of the judgments were issued out, you read it for yourself. The only thing that was cursed was the land. And that's when God programmed it. To not accept the abominable lifestyle that simple man would chose to do with their, with their lives. That's the only thing. Mankind was not cursed. Are they going to have problems? Yes. But the only thing that was cursed, you read for yourself. There in Genesis chapter, chapter uh, 3, I think. The earth was cursed. And there's a reason for it. That curse includes the vomiting up of civilizations that do these abominable acts in its midst. The first one, I'm not going to read all of these verses. Y'all want you, I just want to I just want to introduce you to them. And if you really want to know the details of, Dan, of uh, Leviticus 18, you can go back and read these for yourselves. The incest is the is the number one on the list. That's verses six through eighteen. Now, incest, that's anyone directly related to you or your parents that you have a relationship of that's not a man and wife. That's what that is. Okay? So we got incest. I think everybody kind of understands that. Then there's unclean relational habits. They're in verse 19. Adultery is in verse 20. Now, this is relations with anyone that's not your spouse. Now, Jesus, he even, he even went to the heart of this one. And he says, whoever looketh upon someone to lust has committed adultery in his heart. So abomination number three is adultery. And then the murdering of babies, verse, verse 21. Well, that's abortion. So some of these we recognize, right? That is our land guilty? It's not looking so good. The practice of homosexuality is in verse 22. And then bestiality in verse 23. When all those abominations are being committed 
in the civilization, the, God says the land will vomit you out. It will spew you out. So you want to know why bad things happen like earthquakes and floods and plagues and wars like we've been seeing like crazy for the past couple of years? Look to see if, the, if those civilizations have committed abominations. Now that's going to scare you, isn't it? Because you got to look at the world and we're like, the whole world is doing this. What's the whole world going to do, Brother Mitch? Spew us all out? Yes. And you see that when you get into the book of Revelation. You see the whole world turning against us. Every single nation and country and tribe and tongue, everyone is affected. That's how you know when you're in the last days. When everybody's experiencing the same thing at the same time, you know that this is the end. Isn't that what the scriptures tell us? And here we wonder, well, why would God allow these things? God didn't allow these things. You chose it. We chose it. You can't even have a conversation about not doing these things anymore or you're the bad guy. <clears throat> Defile not yourselves with any of these things. Leviticus 18, 24 says, For in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. Every nation is going to be looked at. And when they do these things, they are judged. They don't have to be judged by God. The actions have already been judged by the land itself. Genesis 3.17. Cursed is the ground for thy sake and sorrow. Thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. There's that verse I was telling you about. The land is cursed for your sake. Can you imagine what it would look like? If mankind was allowed to live by all of those abominations without any repercussions, can you imagine how horrible it would be? It's actually God putting in his hand of mercy and saying, when it gets that bad, the land will stop it. The land will want to heal itself from those things. And it will do so by vomiting out the one that is causing all the problems, that civilization. That's what we see in Genesis 3, 17. So I, I get it. There's some theology there. There's, there's, some understand, there's got to be some understanding of, you know, what, what is Leviticus 18 really trying to say? It's really trying to say is, do your best not to do these things in your civilization or else. You're going to lose your land. The land will kick you out. It will vomit you out. Romans 8.22. The Apostle Paul, he gets, a, he gets a hold of this understanding. And he says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So what do we need to do? Well, what we really need to do is not, set, not turn a blind eye to those things when they're happening. But to understand that the land is groaning, the earth is groaning, the gr earth hurts because of our sins. You think that your sin only hurts yourself. No, it hurts the whole earth. You know, if you if you go up to Washington or or around the world, maybe you go into the U.N. summit, they're going to tell you, no, it's not the sins that are affecting the earth. It's climate change. Climate change is what's hurting the earth. I'll tell you, climate change is the result of abominations that's happening in the earth, on the earth. And we chose it. You want to fix it, fix the abominations. But, oh, we're not allowed to go there. It won't be long until this message will be outlawed by your government. Because I said some key words. I pointed out some sinful natures that people have. They're like, oh, you can't talk bad about those things. It doesn't matter what you tell me that I can or can't do. All you have to do is look around and say, is the earth starting to vomit us out? Are we seeing earthquakes? Are we seeing floods? 
Are we seeing plagues? Are we seeing wars? If you're seeing those things, I guarantee it, you're seeing abominations. But you don't want to see the abominations. People do not want to see their, their sins. They want to live in the darkness because their deeds are evil. And they don't want the light of the glorious gospel to shine on their deeds. But as believers, we're not called to turn a blind eye to, to wickedness and to abominations. We're called to open our eyes to it, to recognize it, and hear the groanings of the earth. And then we can exercise what Solomon tried to teach Israel in 2 Corinthians 7.14. When he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then, he says, will I hear from heaven and heal their land. You can't. If you're turning a blind eye to abominations and sinful lifestyles in your civilization, how in the world are you going to pray for them? Humbling is the first part. God, I'm, I'm living in this world I'm guilty. In Romans chapter 1, it, it, even, it even lists all those things that lead to the, those abominable lifestyles. And then it says that those people who know that it's wrong, that they actually enjoy watching it done. Isn't that what it says in Romans chapter 1? It says they, they enjoy that. If you don't believe me, go look at Romans chapter 1. It's, it's, I think it's the last verse. That God-fearing people Enjoy others doing that? Like, there's no way. Oh, yeah. I know a bunch of God people that say that they love God. Yet, they don't mind looking at some things that they know they're not supposed to. They'll even, they'll even tell certain groups of people, oh, God, God's going to forgive. God loves you no matter what you do, and you're going to go to heaven. I watched a, I watched a message this week from a, a Baptist preacher down in Florida. I didn't know I didn't know this, but there was a I knew that there was a shooting down there that killed a bunch of people. But it was actually it was actually a, a gay bar. And we know that though you know, despite what you believe about their that lifestyle. Um, whether you can go to heaven or not, we know that accompanies that lifestyle is a bunch of things, other things that are against God's word. And those preachers, they didn't know those people, but they preached every one of them into heaven. You see, that's what they do at funerals now. Nobody goes to hell. Nobody's going to be held accountable for their sins. No one's going to be held accountable for their abominations. But we we have a bunch we have a bunch of Baptists that are saying, well, it's okay if you just make a mistake every now and then. It's okay if you watch certain things. It's okay if you know if you've had an affair every every once in a while. No, those things are not okay. Abortion is not okay. The whole list of abominations is not okay. Why, what is going on in our country? What is going on in our world? This is what it is. And you think, well, it's the, abom it's the abomination's fault. It's not really the abomination's fault. It's my people not humbling themselves when they recognize abominations going on. That's what the problem is. We've enjoyed... All, the, all of the lifestyles that those things have brought to us. Yes, sin is fun for a season. But the land will vomit those people up. And we need to pray. We need to pray harder than we ever have. Because you think that we're going to be exempt from what's going on over in Russia? Over in the Ukraine? Do you really think so? What does the Bible actually say about those last days? Nobody's the good guy. Everybody is going to be hit 
with God's judgment. And I don't know about you. I don't know when. I don't know when the complete form of the judgment is coming. But I do know this. I want to be. I want to be looking good in God's eyes when it comes. I want to make sure that I have that. Despite what my civilization has done, that I've humbled myself, I've at least prayed for my country. God, would you do what it need, whatever it would take to get us back in grace with your eyes? Do you think God looks at the United States and says, it is, you have found grace in the eyes of the Lord when you've committed all these abominations? I think not. Don't think that we're going to be able to get out of it. Daniel wasn't able to get out of it, and he found grace. And, you know, and that's where we want to be. We want to be like Daniel. That even though we may be caught up in all of the nonsense that's going on in the land, vomiting its civilization out, we want to be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and we commit ourselves and our bodies as a living sacrifice unto Almighty God. And we do, just like Daniel. Daniel humbled himself. And he put himself right there with Israel. And he says, we are guilty. And he prayed as if he had committed the same sins as Israel. And you know what, what happens in that story? God heard Daniel's prayer. That's where we need to be. And that starts when we humble ourselves and we pray and we seek his face and we turn from those wicked ways. Hey, is there anything in your life that puts you in a compromising position? Is there anything? Put it away from you. Put, turn from it. And then the scripture says. He will heal. Their land. I want God to heal the world. I want God to heal our land. But we know. We know it's full of abominations. And that means that we've got to get down. And we've got to start doing the hard work. Because I guarantee you. The guys up in Washington, D.C. Are not going to do the hard work. Of getting down on their knees. And repenting of their sins. That's going to be where the church is. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. Is the church really doing that? Not the one that I listen to the message from. But we can't hear at Bethany. You can't at your house. Joel 2.12. Listen to what this verse says. Therefore also now saith the Lord. Turn ye even to me with all your heart. That's where it's going to start. When you individually turn to God with all your heart and you are like and you say I am putting away all these things from me I may not can affect that side of the church building I may not can affect this side of the church building I may not can affect this side of the church building but I can affect this side of the church building and I can turn with all my heart and it might be Look what Joel says here. Oh, let me let me add a couple more things in there. With fasting, you want to turn with you want to turn with all your heart. It's going to include fasting, according to Joel. It's going to include weeping. Hey, when was the last time you cried because of what you saw going on? Does what going is does what is going on in the Ukraine hurt your heart? Just wait till it's Mississippi. Just wait till it's Tennessee. Just wait till it's Missouri. How about when it's Arkansas? Will that make you cry? How about when it's Little Rock? Or Circe? When all those things start getting closer and closer to home. How about Memphis? Have you cried about those things? When is it time? Today. That we, that we have a broken heart for the things that we see for those abominations. And there's mourning. You know what the mourning is all about? If you're going to mourn for somebody, why are you mourning for them? Because you've lost them, right? You're never going to see them again. 
You're never going to be able to take back words that you've said. You're never going to give the words that you should have said because you're in mourning. Joel says, when you turn to God with all your heart, you mourn because of those abominations. Because you can't, you can't go back and not and undo those things. All you can do is right now, and it pains you. It breaks you. And you rend your heart. You know, in the old, in the old Testament, when they, to, the way that they would show that they were upset is that they would rend their clothes. God says, I'm, I'm less interested in what, you, what your clothes are looking like on the outside and what your heart is looking like on the inside. When you rend your heart, you want to rend all of those wicked and evil things out of it. You don't want those in, your, in yourself anymore. You want something new. You rend your heart and you turn unto the Lord your God. And this is what he says. If we could do this, he says for her, for he is gracious. Aren't you, good? Aren't you glad that God is gracious? That if it's just us. Maybe if it's just me, that God is so gracious that he would take care of those. You know, when, when the angels were going into Sodom to see if what was going on there was really what he heard the cry of, gave them an opportunity to accept his messengers. And Abraham had been talking to God about this. It, you see, what we saw in Abraham, we saw Abraham. We know he fasted. We know when the angel of the Lord told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to destroy that city. What do you, how do you think Abraham felt about it? He's like, but I know good people there. My, I've got family that lives there. And it, could you see Abraham breaking as he's asking God? But what if there's 50 people there? What if there's 10 people there? Would you destroy it for 10? If there's a lack of 50? What if it gets down? There's only 10 people there. Would you destroy it for 10? And God says, I wouldn't. I won't even destroy it for 10. And what do we see? We see Abraham concerned. You think when the angels left him that Abraham just like, okay, I did what I could. I'm going to go on my merry way. No. It troubled him the whole time. He's like, man, I wonder. I wonder if those angels were able to find 10 people there that love God. That, it, that, turn, that live for him with all their heart. And then he saw the destruction. How do you think Abraham felt? He was mourning. He's like, oh, man. There's some people there I know I'm never going to see again. I know there's some people there. They're busting hell wide open today. And his heart was broken. And I don't even know if he knew that God wouldn't even destroy Sodom if Lot was there. He kicked Lot out so he could destroy the city. So that the land could vomit it up. Do you see that in the picture? We don't even know if Abraham knew. We, do, we may not know. He is merciful. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He's slow to anger. You got to wonder, like, why didn't God take care of this stuff long ago and prevent it from happening? Because God is not like that. He gives people their choice. He gives civilizations a choice. He didn't create a bunch of robots. He gave them free will to serve him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what we have witnessed is that they said no over and over again. And they're still saying no over and over again. And even though they're saying no, God is slow to anger. We even see that in Revelation chapter 5, don't we? When you have the multitude of people that have had their heads beheaded for the Lord. And they cry out to God, oh, how long, O oh Lord, holy and true. Do you not take vengeance on those who have killed and destroyed and tormented your people? You remember reading that in the book of Revelation? And what does God tell them? Hold on. 
wait for just a little while longer until those who are also your brethren have lost their lives the same way that you did. That's, that's Mitch Dahl's version. But that's what the scripture says. And God is slow to anger that even though the saints that have gone before us are saying, God, how long are you going to wait and not deal with that, the abominations that's on the earth? And God is slow to anger. And he's gracious. And he's merciful. And he's like, there's one more. There's one more. Sodom still has one person in it. And of great kindness. You see, even though this world has committed all those abominations, God has still been so kind to this world. Even though the United States has gone the direction of Egypt and Canaan, God has still blessed us immensely because of his great kindness. And if you wonder why we're not facing the same thing that Ukraine is not facing today, it's because there's a remnant left. That's what I believe. I believe that there is a remnant. I believe that there's a few people that are like Joel chapter 2 here. That they do those things. And they're staying it off. They're staying off the judgment because there's still hope. While those people are still seeking the Lord with all of their heart. They turn to the Lord with all their heart. There's still hope. That one more can be saved. Who knoweth? Job continues, if he, the, if the God will return and repent, that doesn't, that doesn't mean he has sins to repent of. That means that he just, he doesn't issue the judgment that has been proclaimed. He says, I'll hold it off and leave a blessing behind him. Man, wouldn't that be good? If we can see the judgment coming to Arkansas or to the United States, but we repented like we did during World War II. Remember that? You don't, do you? Because that was, that was some of your parents. and I Really, it was probably your grandparents, wasn't it? My granddaddy, he fought in World War II. And you know what happened after World War II? The survivors came back. And they had repented of their sins. And they built church after church. After church, and they sent missionary after missionary after missionary. Bethany Baptist Church is a result of what happened right after World War II. Or at least during that time frame that World War II was going on. Is that, is that not right? We are a descendant of guys and, and, and women, godly men and godly women, who did like Joel chapter 2 said. What if, okay, what if we become that generation just like they were. And what happened to the United States? We became an economic superpower. We became a military superpower. God had mercy on us. And he was gracious. And instead of judgment, yeah, we lost some people, but the end was a blessing. And you were living in the blessing. But now it's your turn. Now it's my turn. Are we going to serve the Lord? Are we going to repent? That's where we're at. Where are you at? Do you hear what I'm saying to you today? Why would God allow these things? He would allow those things. Not to punish you. But to bring you to himself. It's because of his mercy. That he won't let you live in that type of lifestyle. Because whoever lives in that type of lifestyle. They don't go to heaven. And God does not. It is not God's will. That any should perish. But that all should have everlasting life. 
He wants to, he will do whatever it takes to get you to him. And he reaches out and he says, if they won't listen to my blessing, maybe they'll listen when I withdraw my hand of blessing. But we could turn everything around. The United States could turn everything around. Maybe not the United States, but the church. The believers in the United States could turn everything around today if we would take Joel's advice. I believe that. Now, I don't know if my message will go viral. But I do know this. It may not go viral on the Internet, but it could go viral in your life. Do you know what that would look like? It would look like you doing what Second Chronicles says. That you would seek the Lord with all your heart. Even though you're not going to understand everything, as Proverbs chapter 3 says, you may not understand any of this. You may not understand all the ones. You don't have to. All you have to know is to lean on him, and he'll direct your paths. And trust him. Trust God. And if there's any sin, do like the psalmist says, Lord, search me. And know me if there's any iniquity inside of me that you would let me know and remove it from me. That's repentance. Our world needs that from God's believers. Brother Sean and Isaac, would you come? Will y'all pray with me, dear Lord? I just ask that you would just help us to really understand what's going on in this world. We know bad things are going to happen when abominations are committed in, in civilizations. Lord, would you help us to recognize how they have affected us and help us, Lord, that we could pray like Daniel did. That we could pray like Abraham did. And that we can recognize that there are problems. But, Lord, we can also know that we can repent ourselves of those things. And we can grow towards you and we can turn from all those wicked things. And I just and I just pray, Lord, that there, there's someone out there that we're going to get to talk to. Someone else out there that's going to look at us and say, where is hope in this world? And we'll be able to tell them there may not be any hope in this world, but there is hope in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can trust in that hope and he'll take care of you. He will save you. So we ask, Lord, that you would just look on us this morning and help us, Lord, that we can search ourselves and understand that these abominations have put us here. Help us, Lord, that we, at least we ourselves, can turn from these in our own lives. Guide us, Lord, in these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.